Uh, welcome to Hyperfire's webinar on Log4j for boards and executives. Thanks for joining us today. Uh, you'll have uh, myself, Tim Jones, Managing Director of Hyperfire, uh, and David Buckingham, um, who should be able to see on your screen, Chairman uh, of Hyperfire and Pentanet, Pentanet um, which is a high growth technology company listed on the ASX. Um, David's an experienced executive with former roles as CEO of both Navitas and IINet. So got some serious uh, street cred on, uh, on boards and executive. Um, in terms of how we're gonna run the webinar today, uh, David's gonna ask me a few questions um, and then uh, halfway through, we'll, we'll reverse that and I'll ask David a few questions. And then hopefully at the end, we'll have a few minutes uh, for some Q and A. So feel free to uh, put, put any questions you have on the, um, on the chat or raise your hand and we'll come to you at the end. Um, this session is gonna be more of a, a commercial perspective um, rather than technical. So, so uh, neither David nor I are technical and we, uh, we don't uh, pretend to be. But if you'd like more technical information, please book a demo uh, via our website um, or you can have a look at our YouTube channel um, for uh, the, the technical webinar uh, Log4J uh, version of this um, by our, our CTO, Stefan Prandtl. Um, so on that note, I'll, uh, I'll hand over to David uh, who's going to ask me a few questions. Um, and then after that, uh, I'll, I'll ask David a few questions. All right. Well, hello, everybody. Um, thanks, Tim. Um, maybe if we could flick to the next slide, um, that would be great. Um, so let's start with the obvious, Tim. What is Log4j and, and uh, what's the vulnerability that's being created out there? Yeah, okay. Um, so David, Log4j, critical vulnerability, it's also called uh, Log4Shell. Um, it exploits the Log4j Java-based logging tool that's used by millions of computers and devices worldwide. And what it does um, is to enable cyber criminals to illegally access your network, your company's network um, and digital asset in order to do uh, nasty things to it, which might include uh, carrying out ransomware or data theft or financial theft, basically things that uh, you don't want happening to your assets. Um, so the, the Log4j vulnerability is being tagged by industry experts as one of the most ser serious cybersecurity vulnerability in years. Um, and as an example, we have Jen Easterly, who's the director of uh, CESAR, um, the, basically the top uh, cybersecurity organisation uh, in the US. She stated that the Log4j vulnerability is the most serious vulnerability she's seen in her decades long career. So that kind of gives you an indication of how serious it is. Um, and MITRE, uh, which is you know, probably the leading cybersecurity standards body, rates the vulnerability um, as, critical, um, as a critical severity and assigned it a CVSS score of 10 out of 10. So again, you can't get much more serious than that. Wow. Um, okay, well, um, let's um, look ahead then. So give us a bit of context about vulnerability and, and what we're seeing early on um, on public um, sites around the world. Yeah, okay. I mean, in terms of, um, you know, how this how Log4j fits into uh, the, 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 the sort of security picture and the network picture, um, what it is, it's a, a Java-based logging tool um, that's used by millions of computers, um, including, you know, anything with web services. So web servers, web applications, uh, network devices, um, and a bunch of other types of software and hardware. Um, so, I mean, really what, what Log4j does, I mean, almost all software will have some form of ability to log. Um, so, you know, for development, for operational, for security purposes. Um, and Log4j is a very common uh, application that's used for, for this type of logging. Tim? Online services. So it's basically a huge right. journal. We just, had a, we just had a log for j interruption there, Tim. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. I think I'm having some, uh, some internet issues. Um, yeah, so basically it's, it's used by software developers um, to keep track of what happens in their software applications uh, or their online services. So it's basically a huge journal of the activity of a system or an application. And the flaw in the log for j software um, potentially allows criminals to take control of servers just by typing a simple line of code. Um, so in basic terms, the, the Log4j vulnerability allows bad actors to execute any code remotely um, without authorization credentials uh, over 
LAN, WAN, or the internet. Um, so yeah, pretty pretty nasty. Wow. Um, okay, well, let's flip to what we're seeing then early on in terms of um, devices and applications um, and, and the sort of seriousness of, of what, what's, what we're picking up as okay. early signs of the attack. Yeah, okay, thanks, David. So, uh, I mean, this is as technical as I'm going to get, um, but basically the, the devices and applications that are vulnerable are any systems and services that use the Apache Log4j uh, between versions 2.0 and 2.15. Um, the range of products that, that potentially are uh, reliant on these versions include products from uh, yeah, a bunch of household names, Atlassian, Amazon, AWS, uh, Avaya, so for internet comms, Microsoft Azure, Cisco uh, you know, devices, uh, Commvault, Fortinet, uh, Oracle, Red Hat, Splunk, uh, VMware. So, I mean, I think uh, you know most most companies are going to have some kind of exposure to uh, you know at least some of those products. I mean, in terms of um, in kind of um, commercial terms, uh, the kind of assets that are exposed to Log4j could include things like you know corporate websites, particularly um, you know e-commerce websites, for example, uh, cloud applications, cloud storage assets cloud network infrastructure, um, and even um, physical network devices like firewalls and, and routers and switches. So it's, it's very expensive, uh, extensive. I mean, um, in terms of exposure uh, to vulnerability, um, as I say, I mean, most, most companies, um, it's highly likely that they're going to have some kind of exposure. Um, and even if your particular tech stack doesn't use Java, um, you should uh, anticipate that your your key suppliers uh, may well, um, yeah, and these kind kind of suppliers could include SaaS vendors, cloud hosting providers, and web service providers, for example. Right. Wow. So it's everywhere, basically. Yeah. Or potential potential to be everywhere. Okay. So let's talk about how serious is it looking at this stage. Yeah. Okay. So. Um, going back to, to uh, Jen Easterly, who's the director of CESA uh, in the US, um, the reason why she believes that the Log4J vulnerability is, is more serious than other cybersecurity flaws that she's seen um, is really three reasons. So ubiquity, simplicity, and complexity. So in terms of ubiquity, as you just said, David, it's everywhere. Um, this is a piece of open source software that's in millions of devices, uh, from video games to hospital equipment to industrial control systems to cloud services. So it literally is everywhere. In terms of simplicity, um, the uh, vulnerability is very trivial to exploit. Um, the criminals don't need uh, a very advanced skill set to be able to intrude onto your network through the vulnerability. The relevant command only requires 12 characters, um, and this provides remote or unauthenticated access to the computer that they're intruding on. Um, in terms of complexity, there's two elements to that. So the first element is that it's complex to find and fix. And what that's really talking about is trying to find or audit uh, all of the different applications and assets in your company's network that may have a log4j vulnerability and then once you have assuming that you've found 100 percent of them um, then you need to go and find uh, patches for all those applications and devices and then roll out patches across your network so it's a big job um, the other element of um, the complexity is that um, it's it's very complex to locate intruders so uh, before patches were done it's likely that you know, many of these millions of computers were actually exploited uh, by criminals uh, who have basically gone in during the vulnerable period, um, set up you know, some kind of backdoor and basically sitting on your network, uh, you know, planning how, what they're going to do with your network down the track. Um, and you know, often finding these intruders on your network is referred to as finding a, a needle in a haystack. Um, okay, so uh, I think 
at this point, we'll we'll switch, um, and I'll I'll ask a few questions to David. Um, so, David, with your your you know position and experience uh, as a as a professional director, um, in your view, why should why should board directors care about Log4j? Isn't it just a, an IT issue for executives to sort out? Um, well, look, I mean, if if you've tracked anything in in this area now in the last 12, 24 months, um, you will have realized as a director that um, the size and scale of exposure that is now happening fairly regularly is way bigger than just the little problem that the IT needs to solve. Um, there have been multiple instances over the last two or three years, certainly that I've been uh, watching of um, all sorts of ransomware, all sorts of theft, um, critical corporate information, whether that be personnel, financial, um, product, um, uh, theft. And then most worryingly for some, for a lot of companies, they've had their customer information um, stolen, hacked and stolen. There are even instances of, of um, people um, having their systems used as slaves to mine Bitcoin. It's that vast now. Um, in terms of potential vulnerability when, when someone someone's allowed into your corporate network. So you, you as a director, you're negligent if you don't care about this stuff, quite frankly, uh, with the number of computers in most networks um, in most organisations now. And the likelihood of attack um, at some point is high. Um, most boards are now saying it's when, not if. Um, so to ignore Log4j when it's as simple and as vast as you just described would be I, I think personally negligent. Um, so you've got to get on to network detection quickly and, and try and find a way to, to discover whether you've, you, you've been accessed or not. Okay. So on that note, um, you know, what can, what can uh, companies do to, you know, to mitigate the risk to start doing something about it? Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm advising it, um, the companies that I'm involved with um, uh, in a sim fairly simplistic, obvious way, um, start with an audit, um, uh, you know, uh, there are lots of agencies out there as well now that are pretty advanced in providing advice so um, on how to do an audit and how to how to do a mitigation strategy so for example there's the the CISA that you mentioned in the USA there's an equivalent in the UK um, there's one down here in Australia called the JCSC lots of acronyms um, but um, they're all accessible um, pretty accessible on online um, they'll they'll walk you through how to do an audit um, uh, including, you know, key suppliers and their systems, as you described earlier. Um, there are, there's information on CISA right now for, um, for dedicated audit, audit work. Um, you've then got a patch. You've then got a, um, what you find, you've got to patch quickly. Um, you know, I know that there are, the door is so vastly open here that, that it's going to take some significant work in some corporate networks and organisational networks to patch because of the number of elements in there that are probably likely to have been affected. Um, but now that, that stops everything, or should stop everything um, getting worse, but of course it doesn't detect and find what's already inside your network, potentially broken and, and being accessed. Um, so that's where you've got to take a proactive step to perform some sort of proactive network security audit um, to find and remove anything criminal before they launch any further attack. Um, now that's not easy. Um, there are next generation tools available now. Obviously, we we're representing the Hyper Fire, which has got uh, one of those tools called Firebug, um, that are specifically designed to um, sit within your within an organisation's network and look for um, threat actors uh, who manage to access and are sitting there waiting to to launch attacks. So, you, 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 we've had six weeks of this thing now. Um, imagine the number of potential networks out there that have got a vulnerability sitting there waiting to be launched. And then obviously you need to report, you know, it's, it's critical that um, the whole environment around cybersecurity learns from each other quickly, because this is a sort of a, a live beast that's, that's that with a huge momentum and escalation by the day is fast. The rate of growth of um, threat is fast. Um, it's critical that we report through the, you know, the governmental bodies, the regulated bodies, what we've discovered and, and, um, and, and you know, ideally our solutions for resolving them. Okay, thanks for that. I mean, what, what kind of questions 
um, should, should directors be asking executives to, you know, to, to track the progress of those kind of activities? Um, yeah, I'll be obvious ones to start with. What are we doing? Okay. Well, what have we got as a mitigation strategy and plan, um, you know, um, to, to identify and, um, uh, you know, work out which assets have been, uh, have got vulnerability um, and where are they? Um, you then got to quickly move your mindset to um, what are the implications, both commercially and technically, um, for the risk that you find. Um, so risk risk management, classic risk management exercise. Um, what will it do for your reputation, your your customers, your vendors, and, and the relationships you have with those, and, and then and the financial performance and implication thereon um, for your organisation. Um, so ask your ask your team to. Your, your leadership team to come back with really clear answers on on those things. What, what and, and that's difficult, you know. Assessing materiality in, in, when things are unknown is really difficult. But you need to do it as a board member to be able to make the judgment call on how how you how you respond next. Um, you know, you want to see some immediate action. So, what is being patched? So, ask the question of your IT organisation: What has been patched? What needs to be patched? What support do you need? To make that happen, um, as well as what support do you need and what resource do you need to to identify what you don't know about sitting within your network that might have come in. Um, you know, they're clear and obvious questions to ask your IT organisation, your security team. Um, you know, there are some others out there. Um, uh, what if we? What if we haven't found something, but we want to get, we want to be ready next time, or potentially ready for the next vulnerability to pop up in your organisation? So to move to proactive preparation planning for an attack uh, and you know an incident response plan. Um, we see those existing in organisations and lots of other spheres outside of cyber. There's no reason why that that approach can't be taken for cyber, which is growing by the minute by the day. Yeah. And um, and one of the other things I've I've sort of noticed as well in some of my organisations is that they're just not ready to deal with um, the government regulations and, and government or authorities that deal with this whole area and, and just simple things like being able to report and being able to interface with those regulatory bodies is, is something that a lot of companies have got to learn how to do. So the sooner you ask that question, the, the more quickly the company will deal with it. Yeah, okay. I mean, it yeah sounds like there's going to be a lot of work for uh, for executives and um, their teams to be doing to to you know address these issues and these these risks. Um, what kind of things can directors do to to help the executive? Um, obvious immediate things are you know I think there's a we're in a world now where um, either certainly additional resource whether that be people or systems um, for for um, proactive management need to be put in the hands of the the IT security team within your organisation. So that, that's upscaling resource, people and systems. Um, I think it's important uh, um, that we, we, you know, take, take a different view to the world now and, and actually, you know, I, I've, I've heard a lot of times in boardrooms are, you know, just do it out of the budget you've got sort of type response. That's, that's not going to work. Um, with things like Log4J out there, that's, it's just not feasible. So, Boards and and, and um, com company boards and, and board directors need to help leadership find additional resource uh, and provide them with a governance framework around specifically around um, cyber security. So if it's not a, a standard item on every board meeting agenda, if, uh, and your organisation has significant um, potential impact from a threat or a vulnerability happening, then you should be pushing it into the boardroom every every time you meet. So providing that framework of safety for management to and, and IT leadership to be able to report, escalate, and then look for support is critical. Um, you know, there are professionals out there. That's the other thing that, um, that organisations should do when they're, they're struggling with something is look to the outside world for professional support. You know, so there are managed security service providers out there now that are, that are um, uh, providing really good and, and you know, cost-effective um, expertise and solutions for organizations that can't do it themselves and don't have the resource internally to do it themselves. So I recommend the use of those. Um, you know, what the one thing I would say though is, is don't wait to find out what's 
found its way into your network through Log4j. Um, you, you, you could be uh, at serious, um, serious risk there of um, big potential impact if you do that. Um, so go and find either a, an IT professional or a managed service uh, security provider that can provide you with the tools to find out what, do, do an audit of your network and find out what's there. Okay. Um, that all makes sense to me. Um, we might uh, just in a sec uh, see if any uh, anyone's got any any questions uh, that they want to uh, put to me or David. Um, just uh, while people are getting their questions together, um, just in terms of um, how Hyperfire is is seeing uh, log for and potentially how we can help. Um, so we we believe we can help with the threat hunting part of the process. Um, so uh, you know, David mentioned uh, our Firebug product um, that product is specifically designed to monitor for monitor for and locate insider threat behaviors um, so in our view firebugs tailor made for locating the criminals that you know may have uh, sort of intruded onto your network before uh, applications were patched um, and you know I guess in in fundamental terms we help find the needle in the haystack and we're very good at that um, and we can help uh, you know your security teams kick out the intruders before they get a chance to to launch launch a you know a ransomware or or other attack or, or just use your your assets for uh, for mining Bitcoin, um, so yeah. So if uh, if you wanted to find out anything further about uh, Firebug, please reach out. Um, or if you just wanted to have a chat about um, you know, log for j risks and what to do next, we're uh, we're more than happy to have a chat. Um, you can um, you know, have further information or find further information on our website, which is www.hubberfire.com. Um, or if you want, you can you can walk demo through the website. Um, so just wondering if anyone has any questions um, they'd like to pose. David, I've got one for you in terms of keeping this front of mind. So this isn't going to go away for organisations, their first breach from this may occur in four months time. How do we keep it front of mind so that activities and support uh, remains? Um, I think the, um, you know, you've got to have the, the, the kind of, um, I guess, open board environment that, um, that always wants to make sure the organisation's thinking about things that, you know, aren't, aren't that, that, Come from the outside, the surprise factor, if you like, to organisations. So, look, I can't. I hope that you're all working for organisations that have that mindset, both in, in board and leadership. Leadership typically focuses inward, um, and um, you know they've got targets to hit, they've got goals to achieve, they've got lots of operational, organisational things to achieve um, that stop them thinking out outwardly um, and thinking about well, what could surprise us. Um, so. You know, I think it takes a brave um, CEO leadership team these days to sort of put time to things that might not might not necessarily allow them to achieve the straight line they're trying to go in at any particular time. But you know, you need to any security expert needs to get in front of their leadership team and find a way to carve out that time and and get the sort of um, the imprimatur of um, of the CEO and, and the leadership team to, to basically um, stamp on the organisation the need to take care. Um, and you did it very well, Gavin. I remember um, when I, when when I was working with you. Um, you know, you, you put the fear of God into me. <laughs> um, that's always a good way to do it. Um, I don't think that's as hard these days with the, with, the, with the amount of communication that people can access as, as leaders and board members. Um, you know, online and, and through media channels these days to know that there's a, a growing and vast, uh, just been made worse by Local J, world out there that they need to take seriously. But, um, you know, the minute everyone walks either into their office or into their virtual office these days, you know, that mindset comes to the straight line, doesn't it? So I think, um, you know, create some, create some reporting um, that just pops up in their face um, regularly, you know, I think that's a good way, a good, simple, effective way of saying, hey, lights are still flashing here, don't forget about us. Um, we know you've got your straight line, but um, today we're taking care of things um, and we're all good today, but, you know, there's going to be a day where it's not going to be all good. So reporting 
upwards and creating a reporting structure in your IT organization is, is, a, is a critical thing to do, I think. Um, I think the, um, the, there's a lot of simple things you can do um, around just good, solid, disciplined behavior in your organization that's, that keeps things out, right? So, I mean, you know, training programs around what is a, what is a phishing email, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you know, I think if the IT organization is clever enough and can, can be that sort of internal champion and trainer for the CEO, so he doesn't have to put pressure on somewhere else in his organization. Um, so be, be creative about how you, you create sort of internal training mechanisms for staff that you can roll out quickly online. Um, you know, I've, been, I've seen some great ones um, in some of the organizations I've been involved in. That just takes the pressure off the CEO from dragging resource away from the straight line they're trying to deliver um, to something else that might not necessarily add value um, you know, to, to that straight line. So you've got to, you've got to be creative in your, in your communication and, your, um, and, and, and the way you help the organization. Um, there's lots of good stuff out there as well, as I said. Um, you know, access to MSSPs, um, you can you know, go on the Hyperfly website and you'll see a couple of our champions at the moment. They're not that expensive um, for peace of mind, the kind of peace of mind you can bring to your organisation. So fight, fight for budget, fight for budget is the other thing I would say. Fight for, you know, you don't need huge resource, but fight for budget both for, um, for, 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 for some of that sort of framework that can, can keep you, your organization in pretty good shape. That's good. Thanks, David. I, I agree 100% with that MSSP, put the uh, resourcing challenges, let them, let them handle it. Um, yeah. 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 They're pretty, you know, I'm, I've been quite impressed with some of the, some of the um, levels of you know, financial level of investment that's required to get that expertise in your organization. And, it, and it's moving so fast, Gavin, you know, it, it's hard for a, an IT organization, again, that's focused on delivering the goals of the organization to, to just keep itself up to date with what's going on out there. Um, the, these MSSPs, you know, they're specialists at it. Equally, you know, Hyperfire, um, I've had some, some, some interesting conversations with Tim about Firebug. You know, it's a, it's a very accessible, affordable piece of, 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 of you know, um, threat software. I think so. Um, uh, the other thing to add is we'll, we'll be releasing uh, a briefing paper based on the information in this webinar, which um, you know could could be a potential uh, you know first port of call to to send uh, you know boards and directors just to provide them with a snapshot to get up to speed um, you know in in kind of two or three pages. Um, I mean, there's plenty plenty of information out there. This is just uh, our take on it, but we've certainly tried to make it um, as accessible to directors as possible. Um, so we'll we'll share that with the uh, with the attendees uh, as well. So just keep an eye out for that one. Um, did we have any other questions? Just conscious of time. Uh, so perhaps if we wrap up. Um, so All thanks. Right, I, had, I, had one, I had one for the for the guests on the call. Um, do you have active network monitoring in place in your core network? Not. I'm not talking about edge. And, various other parts, you know, email systems, that sort of stuff. But in your core network, do you have? I'd be interested to know who's got active detection software. Yeah, we, we have EDR on uh, the endpoints. That we right. Have. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I guess, I guess where we see, you know, something like Hyperfire helping is that, um, uh, you know, this is an early warning system that sits on your network. Um, so if intruders are able to get around uh, EDR, which is increasingly common these days, uh, just provides you with um, an additional level of, of monitoring, uh, you know, at, at the network level. Um, uh, so, yeah, if anyone wants further information, yeah, feel free to reach out. Okay, so yeah, just conscious of, uh, of time, so we might wrap up. So thanks everyone for, for sharing your time with us today. Uh, I hope we've left you with some, some new information. As I said, please reach out if you'd like to talk to us further, more than, more than happy to um, you know, sit down and have a, have a chat. Um, thanks to David Buckingham uh, for your insights onto um, you know, board level matters, um, and also to Dave Hack for organizing everything behind the scenes. And um, we hope to speak to you down the track. Thanks again for joining.